It is a strange irony of history that the person you're about to be introduced to will be forever linked with Che Guevara because the two men could not be more different. Che devoted his life to tyranny and death, and this man has devoted his entire life to freedom and life. He played an important role in stopping Che's murderous quest for communist revolution all around the world. Along, alongside Castro, Che terrorized Cuba, the nation where my next guest was born. So it was fitting, I guess, strangely, as you hear him tell the story, that he was there in the mountains of Bolivia in 1967 to be the man who heard Che's final words. He was in the CIA. He was part of the Bay of Pigs disaster. He was in Vietnam, played a huge role there. He put a price uh, on Che's head and, and because of that had a price put on his head. He also fought communism in El Salvador in the 1980s. He was a victim of a witch hunt by a U.S. senator. He participated in some of the most pivotal events in the last 50 years of U.S. history and has a different look at even the JFK assassination. But in the end, as he's written in his memoir, he is just a man from an island nation of Cuba who's just having a really hard time getting home. Today... The man who helped capture Che Guevara. I have interviewed celebrities, I've interviewed presidents, and my staff doesn't usually get excited. You, on the other hand, everybody is very excited to hear what you have to say because you have been not just a witness you've been you've been right there and uh and and a catalyst in many cases of some of the biggest stories since kennedy since castro went into cuba uh and i can't wait to get to the part about che and to hear what he's what he was really like from somebody who met him talked to him and i i gather in some way uh it kind of liked him appreciated him at the end as a human being when you were talking to him because you were extremely kind to him yes he was very hard you know i had in my mind what he had done yes the people who had assassinated but then when i first saw him uh, the image that I had from him was completely different. Here's a man that was completely in rack. He looks like a uh, beggar. Uh, I remember uh, his picture when he went to see Mao and the people of the Soviet Union and then see the way he was. Uh, you know, it, like a human being, you feel sorry for him. Yeah. And that's what happened to me. But you can get past all the feeling sorry for him uh, when you actually know what he did. And I want to get into that. But um, you were born in 1941 right. in Cuba. Uh, and your, uh, your parents did what in Cuba? My father had a store in my hometown, Santi Espiritus, that he ran there. Okay. Then actually in 1952, uh, when Batista took over, my uncle was my secretary of public work. Uh, my mother went to Havana, and that's when I moved with her. Okay. We spent a couple of years there. Uh, then my uncle offered me to go to school in the estate. So actually, in 1954, I came to Pennsylvania. I went to Perkiom in preparatory school for high school. And I spent there until 1960 when I graduated. Okay, so before we get to that part, moving to the United States uh, and where your parents ended up, um, tell me about Batista, because people don't really know about Batista and what the revolution was all about in Cuba. Batista come from a very, very poor uh, ancestors. Uh, he was uh, working railroad before. He saw his brother, for example, die from uh, pneumonia, and he didn't have any hospital to treat him. That's why he built up as the Coyante. So when he first took over in 1933, and he became president legally, you know, by vote, uh, he was a very good president. And then when he went wrong for the election, he lost. He turned over the presidency to whoever had won the elections then. Then later on, he moved to the United States and uh, in Florida. And actually, he didn't plan the military coup that took place in 1952. People went to him 
from the military who were very, very uh, in disagreement with the President Prio, who was treating them very well. They had very low salaries, and the army was going to make a military coup no matter what. Mm-hmm. And he was the only leader that everybody will so- go so around him. Otherwise, it was going to be probably some bloodshed. So he agreed to go ahead and head the military coup that took place in 1952. Now, uh, he interrupted the, the democratic process in Cuba, but at the time, there were a lot of problems in Havana. For example, a lot of these gangsters were, like in, in the time here when uh, Al Capone, they were taking banks. Yeah. Uh, there, there was The army was in very poor shape. And uh, and he restored a lot of that, and it was the area where Cuba really progressed a lot of. He did a lot of uh, buildings, construction, highway, hospital, a school. But of course, then the, you know uh, power becomes a problem. And uh, yeah, yeah. Um, now uh, the Castros. Who were the Castros before they became Castro? Well, Castro was always a. a, a, a kind of a revolutionary. He was not in agreement with the, the local situation at all. He participated in the Bogotazo in Colombia, uh, and he was uh, un revoltoso, we call him there. Which meant? Uh, a guy who is uh, he's, he's not in tune with the society. Okay, okay. He, was, you know, he wanted to do something extraordinary. I recall people told me one time he went to visit the president of Cuba. He wanted to throw him down from the, uh, from the uh, balcony to become prominent. Uh, he wants to be recognized. Right. Uh, he ran for congressman. He didn't make it. Uh, so he did the Moncada attack where he became notorious because of that. And now he became then public to the Cuban people. Which was, what, what, what attack was that? In 1956-67, uh, he attacked the Moncada barracks in Oriente province. And uh, they killed a lot of soldiers. It was actually part, they have a, a hospital in there. They killed a lot of people in there. Then he ran into the mountain. That's when he became known. That took place on the 26th of July. Okay. So he used that uh, momentum of that operation to call his movement 26th of July. Okay. Now you're not there at the time. Your parents, no. your parents, they're there. Um, but you're living in Pennsylvania. You right. get an offer to live there and be educated in the United States. And your parents say, you got to take this opportunity. Yeah, but I went back to Cuba in every single time that I had an opportunity to. So I went back to Cuba five times a year yeah. for Christmas vacation, summer vacation, it was spring home. vacation, everywhere. Yeah, it was home. Um, and then your folks, during the Cuban Revolution, your parents happened to be vacationing in Mexico. Right. Uh, and so you're in Pennsylvania. They're in Mexico. The revolution happens. Uh, if they would have been there, what do you suppose would have happened? Well, they took my uncle's home in Havana. They ransacked and everything. But my parents were already in Mexico for uh, Christmas during that time. So I went from Pennsylvania to meet them uh, in 1958, December of 1958. We spent New Year's together. That's when Castro took over, when mm-hmm. Batista left. And uh, I actually had a ticket to go from there to Cuba, which I never used because of the revolution itself. Then the thing that really impacted me that made the difference was when I saw those massive execution that took place. Cuba never had the death penalty before. And this guy was executing people right and left, and there was the process were so unbelievable, uh, unreal. Uh, the one that really impacted me when they did a, a, uh, a trial for Sosa Blanco, he was a major in the Cuban army, and they brought a witness who claimed that Sosa Blanco had assassinated his brother. And when the guy got into the room, he started pointing at the prosecutor and telling the prosecutor, you killed my brother. He had, to be, he had to be told, no, no, it's the guy next to him. So, I mean, it was ridiculous. And then later on we found out, and I, Sosa Blanco was executed, that his brother was in Miami, and he never told his family. So he was never killed by anybody. Oh he went gosh. back to Cuba after that. So that impacted me to the point that I decided I had to do something. So people, strangely, um, here in the United States, either know who these people are and know that they were monsters, um, or they look at them like, I don't know, Swedish socialists. Well, the thing is, remember when the, when Castro was visited by Herbert Matthews, the newspaper guy in the Sierra Maestra, he made him like a hero. He made him like a Robin Hood to the American public mm-hmm. and portray him that like this guy is going to save Cuba, who, who was a bunch of few people were fighting this bigger army and all of that thing. And that was one of the things that really impacted a lot of the American population here. So it's very similar to what the American press did with Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. Absolutely. Okay. Um, now, 
you graduate uh, from school. Um, this is your home. You want to uh, you want to free your home and and claim your home. Uh, and you go. Where do you go and see this big anti-communist movement? Well, Glenn, before I graduated in 1959, I went to visit my parents. And the member from the Cuban Constitutional Army was recruiting people for the first operation against Castro that took place in the Dominican Republic, what was called the Anti-Communist Legion of the Caribbean. I was 17 years old at the time. So I joined that. I uh, actually had to forfeit my father's signature to be able to get a visa because I was a minor at the uh, Dominican Embassy in Mexico. So I, well, actually on the 4th of July, I arrived in the Dominican Republic. That was a fiasco. I came back, I graduated. And then I applied to the University of Miami for engineering, and I was accepted. I got my letter of acceptance. Then when I got to Miami, I found out there was somewhere in Latin America, a place that they were training uh, to fight against Castro. I decided that was more important than going to school and go to the university here. That's when I joined uh, what later was called the Bay of Pig. I can't believe I'm talking to somebody who was there at the Bay of Pigs. Um, explain for anybody who doesn't know what that is, what that was. In the early 1960s, President Eisenhower received information from the intelligence services that the Soviets were planning to bring offensive missions to the Cuba. So that's why Eisenhower ordered the CIA to destabilize the Castro regime. That's why a lot of people believe, you know, why do they give an invasion uh, to the CIA and not the Pentagon? It wasn't supposed to be an invasion. It was supposed to be a guerrilla warfare in the Escambray. They brought a Filipino colonel by the name of Vallejo, whose real name was uh, Napoleon Valeriano, who was very successful in the war against the Hawk in the Philippines. And the training that he started in Guatemala was three different groups, what they called the great teams, the black teams, and the occupational force. It was supposed to be an operation to increment the guerrillas in the Escambray Mountain in the middle of the island, who was already taking place. And once we'd be able to have a stronghold in there, declare a provisional government in arms. And what happened? Well... Elections took place in this country. And then uh, President Kennedy was elected president. When he was briefed on the operation, he decided to continue but change the concept altogether. So they took this uh, Colonel Vallejo Valeriano out of the picture. They brought a guy from the Pentagon. They disbanded the, the black teams because the idea was that the great team will go into Cuba before. That was, our, that was part of it, infiltration team. We start working the resistance. Once the people start going to the mountain, they bring the black teams. There were 25 men each, highly trained, explosive demolition, air reception, maritime reception to receive weapons. And once there was a guerrilla strong enough to secure a small area, they will bring the rest of the brigade with a provisional civilian government, a powerful radio station. We declared to the world there was a government in arms promoting and guaranteeing a free election within a year. And that's what's going to be recognized by the OAS and by the United States. And of course, we all know. 99% American troops, 1% Latin American troops, and that was the end of Castro. Mm. Now, before the Bay of Pigs, though, you were part of a three-man team uh, that, is that right? Three-man team that went in, or, or you, were, you were off the coast of Cuba with Soviet weapons, and you were going to go in and assassinate Fidel. Yes, well, we were in Panama on training after they, when they took the infiltration thing, or great thing. Now, this was not, was this an American mission? No, no, let me explain. Okay. We went from, you know, the, the great teams, we went from, from Guatemala into Panama for additional training with okay. Soviet equipment and everything. While we were there, a friend of mine, by the name of Segundo Borja and myself, went to talk to the CIA guy responsible for it, and we volunteered to kill Castro because we felt if we could eliminate him, it would shorten the war and save sure. a lot of life. sure. So when we went in January, we came to Miami and we went to a, a, a place in Homestead area. Uh, they told me the operation was approved. So they gave me a rifle with a telescopic sight, a very powerful rifle, uh, 20 rounds of ammunition. They told me I only needed a few. And uh, he said not to touch the sight. was already pre-sighted to this and I was going to kill Castro. So they added one more man to my team who was the radio operator, Javier Soto, who is now a present commissioner in Dade County, Florida. They gave us a luxurious jet to infiltrate Cuba, a white boat. Later on, we learned it did belong to Sergeant Shriver, relative of President Kennedy. Yeah, wait, a minute, wait a minute. That's Maria Shriver's father, right? Well, his, his father had a boat, apparently. Yeah. A very luxurious one. And they used that boat for that operation. It was an American captain and then a Ukrainian and a Romanian crew. All with Soviet equipment. And they were supposed to infiltrate us into Cuba. And then they would tell us where to go to, to a place to assassinate Castro. So here's a Kennedy using the boat, and you wouldn't think that a 
Kennedy or someone in the Kennedy family would would be a part of that. At least history would tell us that different. Am I wrong on that? Well, let me tell you, later on, after the Bay of Pig, they were very much committed to eliminate Castro. When we had an operation after the Bay of Pig, we say our team in Central America. Huh. So that didn't, that didn't happen. No, twice we got into the Cuban coastline. The boat who was supposed to be meeting us, uh, was, we were supposed to go into that boat, never arrived. So the third time we came back, and then they took the rifle away. They told me it was uh, uh, terminated that operation. Somehow they canceled, and I went in like the member of the infiltration team for Las Villas. There were five of us, including Edgar Sopo. Uh, we all infiltrated Cuba on the last part of February of 1961. And, um, and how did you avoid uh, the trouble off the Bay of Pigs? How did you... Well, we were part of the Bay of Pigs, so we were like we call it the Special Forces of the Brigade. Right. So our group that was about, uh, all together we entered less than 40, 30 some people inside Cuba. There was very few of them who entered through the airport. This was legal documentation claiming they were coming back from American University. One team parachuted over in Camagüey Bronze, and the rest of us entered clandestinely by boat to the Cuban line. And we had a mechanism with the resistance that they would have a guy to pick us up at the, at the coastline. They would walk us like several kilometers into the main highway. Then car from the resistance would pick us up and take off to say half in Havana. And then there we start working with the, the internal resistance against Castro. And so what they changed the, they changed the, um, the team and the strategy, but what happened in the end on the ground? Well, one thing that we always make comments uh, about it is that they never advise us of the invasion coming in. We had enough explosive and equipment to be able to blow bridges on the way to the Bay of Pigs. But they never confided in us. They never told us anything. When they actually learned of the invasion coming on through the radio, through the Cuban radio, on the 17th of April, when they started calling all the militias to join, uh, you know, go to their military units and all of that. Uh, we never received a thing from our stations in, in Miami until after the invasion took place. And it was impossible to do anything at the time because Castro did something that was very intelligent. Especially in the main cities, including Havana, they went house by house and block by block. They surrounded with soldiers. And if you were a male and you were not assigned to a military unit, even if they have nothing that you were engaged in the regime or anything like that, they will pick you up and put you in a temporary, like say, concentration camp. Like baseball wow. field with high fences had 250,000 Cubans. Wow. The Blanquita Theater, who has a capacity of 5,000, had 5,500 people in there. So they were able to disarticulate the Cuban internal resistance, who was very well organized. They pick up a lot of our people who were released later because they had no idea who they had. But they destroyed the operational capability of our units. Was Were, were the Soviets involved with intelligence? With Cuba, no. That, they, well, they supported them with intelligence, but that was strictly a Cuban operation. Okay, but they did support later. And how active were they? And oh, I mean, all they, along, all they along, they seemed to be ahead of, yes. of everything. And the Czechoslovakian intelligence, all of those were very closely with the Cuban intelligence. So uh, you leave this, and you're not really working for the government. You're kind of just a revolutionary at this time, if you will, or a freedom we fighter. We didn't know that we were working for the CIA. You didn't the know? No. Yeah, okay. But you were, actually. But we were. Okay. Um, and, and I read something where it said that you volunteered to go to work for the CIA. I didn't know they took volunteers. Well, it was not a way of volunteering. You know, when you are in that system, you are part of it. And then, you know, uh, lear- later I learned it was the CIA, so I continued to work with them. Uh, after the Bay of Pigs. So after the Bay of Pigs uh, was a fiasco, I had to seek political asylum in the Venezuelan embassy in Havana, mm. which I spent like six months as a, a political uh, um, asylum people. And on the 13th of September of 1961, they flew us out of Havana with a diplomatic coverage of being a political exile to Venezuela. I spent a couple of weeks in Venezuela and early in October of 1961, uh, the agency asked me to go back inside Cuba to reestablish contact with the resistance. So I started traveling to Cuba uh, with intelligence team uh, in October of the same year. I made like seven different trips to Cuba during that time, brought in teams and everything until after the Bay of Pigs. And, and it was the Bay of Pigs that really kind of turned the psyche of Cubans, wasn't it? That it was, it, they kind of lost hope that... Oh, yes. 
after the fiasco, a lot of people who were helping us, when they saw that no longer uh, a success, uh, then a lot of people retrieved the support from us. They were afraid because they knew that if they were captured, they would spend years and years and years in prison. So actually, let me tell you, in 1962, I completely quit the CIA. 1962? Yeah, I decided to get married to my present wife of 57 years. Oh, good for you. And, uh, you know, uh, what I told her before we got married, I said, look, if there is anything serious about you, I will go. If you agree on that, we get married. If you don't, we don't. And she made the mistake of agreeing to that. <laughs> because it only lasted two months. We were married on the 25th of August. I started working, first of all, in, in a company who did manufacture some uh, propaganda for a hotel, and then in a meat company called Tobin Packaging Company. In October of that year, I got a call by Tom Klein, a guy from the CIA, who asked me to meet him at the parking lot of the Howard and Johnson across from the University of Miami. So when I finished my work, that was two months after we got married. I go to this parking lot, I sat in his car, and he looked at me and said, Felix, the Marines are going to land in Cuba, and we need you. And I look at him and say, Tom, if the Marines are going to land in Cuba, what the hell do you need me for? <laughs> I say, well, uh, we need you to parachute near a Soviet base in Santa Clara with a radio beacon to set it up on a pre-located area that we're going to give you so that our, our Air Force can hit with precision the missile base. Because at the time, they didn't have the GPS sure, and sure. The navigation system we have today. So I agree, and from that point on, they took me to a hotel uh, I do, couldn't even call my wife. She didn't know anything. And uh, they gave me the training from a table, my three point of contact, the jumping. That was my parachute train, training during the time. And then the day they brought the parachute, they were ready to go into Cuba. That's when Khrushchev backed down. If he had delayed for 15 hours, we have landed there, nothing happened. Mm -hmm. but we were lucky that he did that before we were able to land inside Cuba. So then after that, you know, I was. Uh, without a job, so I continued to work from the CIA from there on. <laughs> well, who else asked you to jump out of a plane and stop right. the Cuban Missile Crisis? Um, uh, tell me about Che and who he was. You, you see people wearing these T-shirts of Che, and to me, it is like wearing a T-shirt with Hitler's face on it. Um, he was not a good man. And somehow or another, he's been turned into a good man and a product. Right. Uh, who was he? Well, he was a cold-blooded assassin. Uh, let me tell you how I got there. In 66, I went to Venezuela on behalf of the agency to set up some communication equipment. Uh, in 67, they called me to a meeting in Miami with an interview, like 16 Cuban, and then they got two of us to go to Bolivia to advise uh, the Second Ranger Battalion. And the reason they were using Cuban was because we were not U.S. citizens. Ambassador uh, Henderson, who was the U.S. ambassador, had a prohibition of uh, American citizens participating in combat or areas of danger because Vietnam was already taking place and there were people coming back in plastic bags from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And they didn't that, want that to happen from South America. So I remember that uh, after my interview with this guy who selected me, he, and later on I asked him, why do you select me? He said, what question I asked you at the end of every interview was, when will you be ready to be trying to, to go to Bolivia in this case for, for an operation? Everybody told him I need a few days, whatever. My answer to him was, uh, if I have time, I'll go to my home. I say goodbye to my wife, to my kids, bring my clothes, and we go. <laughs> we don't have time. I give me the phone. I call Ross and tell her I have to go. And if we don't have time, let's go. I'll give you her number, and you call her, and you tell her I have to go. I guess nobody ever told him that. <laughs> that and that's why he selected me it. to go to Bolivia in that operation. Wow. So we, land, we landed in Bolivia uh, and start, um, first of all, we, the first day that we arrived, we took, they took us directly from the airport to see President Barrientos. Okay, stop home. for a second, because you're telling me the story now of capturing him, right. right? Tell me who he was. Tell me the butcher that he was. So people have an, an understanding of who Che really was in Cuba. He was really, I think, a frustrated individual. Uh, and he developed a, a love for assassinating people. He even wrote his father saying that he has tasted that and he loved to kill people, which he did. He was responsible for hundreds of executions at La Cabana Fortress. He personally executed a lot of people himself, personally. There were two incidents that I learned from uh, later on. One was a lady uh, who I met in a funeral home in Miami, and she was telling me when she learned where, that I was in Bolivia at that time that her son was 17 years old in 1961, they had picked him up and they were going to execute him. And she went to see Che at La Cabana and asked him for mercy. So Che looked at her and said, uh, what is the name of your son? And she gave the name. When he going to be executed? It was a Monday. They said, this coming Friday, Commander. Please save his life. He's not going to do it again. 
So he called for an assistant, and she thought she had saved his life when he told the assistant, what get the lady's son now and execute him now so she doesn't have to wait until Friday. That was she his version she, of mercy. That's right, and she fainted. Later on, I met uh, about a few, a few months ago a lady whose father was later executed in Cuba, was in, in the police. And she claimed that she was at 10 o'clock in the morning, this line to be able to see his father, La Cabana por- Fortress. And this lady who was with her started asking, calling Che when he arrived. And when she arrived, she said, please, Commander, you know, my son has been in prison now for two weeks. I haven't been able to sleep in these two weeks. Please save his life. He's very young. He asked the same thing. What's the name of your son? He called and assisted to bring her son right in front of her. And there was a bunch of people waiting to, to see their different families who were in prison there. And he told the, the kid, get on the floor, you SOB. You have your mother two weeks without sleeping because of you. He put out his pistol and shot him in the head. Oh, my gosh. He said all the people in the line started calling him assassin. And they stopped it. That day, nobody could see. Their, they, they disbanded everybody. They could not go in and, and visit uh, their prisoners. That was the type of man that he was. Um, all right. Do you have any thoughts on why he has been turned into such a hero? Well, Q is responsible to a great extent for the propaganda they made worldwide, using the, the picture with his uh, beret, yeah. and that became like a, a symbol. Mm-hmm. Um, but people really doesn't know who really he was. The people of Cuba still know who he is? A lot of people of Cuba are beginning to know now who he was, yes. But before, no. Even in the school, they have to say, pioneros por el comunismo, seremos como el Che. You know, pioneers for, for communism will be like Che every day before they start classes in the wow. morning. So it was a continuous indoctrination, of, you know, like a big figure who died for the revolution, for the poor, which was not the case at all. All right. So now you're in Bolivia and you go meet the president. It's what year? That was in 1967. 67. Uh, and everybody's looking for Che. Right. First of all, let me tell you, they they found out that Che was there when they captured the Bray and Bustos. There were two, one Argentinian journalist and an intellectual from France who were captured. Because before, they had the belief that Che had been killing Africa. Che was in Africa in 1964-65. All the military equipment that he received in Africa was from Red China. Che was pro-Chinese. And that's why Cuba had completely abandoned him and were on the destruction to try to get him uh, captured or destroyed in Bolivia. Because Cuba depended on the Soviet Union and Che was pro-Chinese. So mm. the thing that I can tell you this definitely it was like that was, first of all, uh, the radio station, the radio that they gave him to transmit back to Cuba, when, he, when it arrived to Bolivia, was broken. He could not communicate with, Bolivia, with uh, Cuba. The head of the Communist Party, uh, Party in Bolivia, Mario Monge, who had met with Fidel two months before, went to see Che the 31st of December of, of, of 1966, where they had dinner together for New Year's Eve, and they retreat all the support from the Communist Party from him even told the people from the Communist Party who were accompanying him that they stay with him, they would be expelled from the Communist Party. Mm. And then the man that they had to help him, his name was Renan Montero, an from the Cuban uh, intelligence uh, section, who was is in place in La Paz, who got tremendous contact. The guy was even invited to some of President Barrientos' uh, Paris at the presidential palace. Once she was in all 17 people, they retrieved him back to Cuba with the pretext that his visa had expired. And he had acquired the, the Bolivian citizenship. So it's, it's a strong indication that he was sent there to be killed, definitely. So, so this is bizarre. Um, the guy who they still have on sides of buildings, his face in the beret. Right. Jay, they, they say they love him. They're still making him into a hero. But it was Cuba that wanted him dead. Right. And Russia. Absolutely. Okay. Do you know why? Why did he flip, or did, was he always against Russia? I think he was always a sympathizer of Mao. Who is even a bigger monster? Well, <laughs> but let me tell you, in 1963, when he went to that trip through Algier, they gave him a reception at the uh, Cuban embassy in Cairo. And one diplomat who was there, who later defected, told us, that during that thing, he actually went to a fifth fight with the Soviet ambassador because of ideology, ideology because he was pro-Chinese. So oh. definitely he was in no uh, good turn with the Soviet Union whatsoever. So they send him to Bolivia. Yes, to be, um, to be killed. And how, uh, how does this involve you now? Well, I was supposed to be advising the 2nd Ranger Battalion in intelligence with them, give them the capability. 
when they learned that Che was there, and of course the Bolivian uh, army was very poorly pro- prepared, uh, they sent a special forces team, MTT from Panama, headed by Papi Shelton, a major from Tennessee, who trained a second ranger battalion, specialized in counterinsurgency. So those were the two factors. Uh, the special forces training this battalion, and we representing the, the, the intelligence community, supporting them in intelligence, in, not, not only in La Paz, but also in the operational area. So I became like an advisor to, uh, to the 8th Division headquarters at the area where he was operating. And I was working directly with Colonel Centeno Anaya, the commander of the division, and Major Arnaldo Saucedo, who was the head of intelligence. So whenever they captured some documents and things like that, I went with them uh, to oversee documentation, do the exploitation of the documentation, etc. So that became uh, very effective. Uh, for example, uh, there was an encounter uh, of a commander of uh, the Cuban uh, guerrilla, Juan Vitalio Acuña Nuño, who had separated from Che to do a, a uh, sort of exploration on the other side of, of the Rio Grande. And he was trying to come back to where Che was on the 4th Division headquarters. And of course, the Rio Grande is uh, very difficult to cross when there is rainy season. They have to know where, otherwise, even the guerrilla law, some people trying to cross it by themselves. So they went to this campesino, Colo Norato Rojas, uh, to tell him where to cross, and he already was working with, for the army. So who went to a captain nearby and told him the location where they were going to cross, and they basically annihilated the whole guerrilla with the exception of three guys. One left by the river, one was captured, was Paco Jose Castillo Chavez, and Ernesto McMuir was executed after he was captured. And we knew from the briefing in Washington that Paco wanted to defect, to leave, because he was not a, he was not a guerrilla. He was a communist, but not a guerrilla. He was told he was going to visit Cuba, the Soviet Union. When he arrived to this place, they gave him a rifle and you are a guerrilla. So mm. Pac would be an excellent individual to be able to talk to. So I was able to save his life uh, when he was, his, he was brought to um, Valle Grande and brought him with us. And he was the one who gave us all the information how Che will move, who became very, very important to us later on. Uh, he told us, for example, when Che moved from point A to point B, he divided his guerrilla in three groups. About five or six guerrilla will go ahead of him, what they call the vanguard in front, one kilometer ahead. He will be in the middle with the with the strength of the troops, and then in the back, one kilometer behind, another five or six guerrilla. He gave us all the uh, name Zudo that they were using at the time. Mm-hmm. So later on, in late September of 1967, when there was an encounter of a lieutenant Galindo with the guerrilla, they got three guerrillas killed. So we went to meet him in Pucará to receive the three bodies. And the name of these three bodies coincided with the vanguard of Che. One was Coco Peredo, the leader on the Bolivian side. The other one was Mario Gutierrez Adari, a, med- a, doctor, a, Cuban, a, a Bolivian doctor. And the other one was Miguel, a Cuban uh, captain, who later we learned was Manuel Hernandez Osorio. This was member of the vanguard of Che. Then when I talked to Lieutenant Galindo, he told me, my Capitan, I saw the guerrilla in the distance. I started preparing the ambush, and suddenly the guerrilla surprised me. What he saw was Che's group. The vanguard was coming up. So that confirmed that was Che's group. So with this information, I went to see uh, Colonel Centeno Nayan and asked him to cut the training of the battalion short, who was basically finished already or the whole training, and bring it to operation. And because we knew that Shea was in the area. And he did so. So on the last part uh, of, of September, actually on the 1st of October, the battalion was deployed in the operational area, four companies. One stayed in Valle Grande to support them with communication, food, and ammunition. One company commanded by Captain Lopez Leighton was along the Rio Grande, so they could not cross to the other side. Mm-hmm. One's commanded by, by Celso Torelli, a captain, another captain who later became president of Bolivia. Uh, he was a reaction force. And Captain Gary Prado was the one, the one doing the search in the area. They actually started on the 1st of September. And on the 7th of September in the evening, they got information from farmers that there were these people in, in uh, guerrillas in this area. So on the 8th, they surrounded uh, the, the, the area. On the 8th, when they advanced, that's when Che was there. And that was the firefight took place, and, and, and he was captured alive. Were you, and you were, were you there? I was at, a, in, in, on the 7th, I was in Valle Grande, uh, setting up some PRC-10 radios on Bolivian combat planes. Because they didn't have frequency compatible, and the, they could not get uh, air-to-ground support to the troops. Wow. So I, I borrowed three PRC-10 radio, starting installing one in every one of those aircraft. Mm-hmm. So on the 8th, I had that uh, radios already in place. And then when they told us that Papa Cansado, who was the code that the leader of the guerrilla was captured alive, and we didn't know whether it was Che or was Inti Peredo, a, a Coco's brother, I flew in the back of one of the 86s and the head of operations, Serrat, in the back of the other, and we were confirmed that Papa Cansado was the foreigner. So we knew that Che was there. 
So that day, Colonel Centeno dispatched Lieutenant Colonel Celis to be able to gather all the documentation, trying to interrogate Shea. And we had a dinner at the hotel uh, in Valle Grande, and I asked the colonel if I could accompany him. Everybody wanted to go with him. Um, but I had an excellent relationship with all of them, so he agreed that I accompany him. And on the following day, that was the 9th of October, who was a Monday, uh, we flew in a small helicopter uh, who was piloted by Jaime Niño Guzman, a Bolivian mayor, and we landed right next to a schoolhouse where he was. And there was all of these officers waiting for, for us in there. We came into the room. Che was as, in his, on the floor on the left side under a little um, uh, window. In the back of the, of the room was the dead body of two Cubans, Major Pantoja, Captain Pantoja, and another Cuban officer. And uh, he started asking questions to Che. Che will look at him at the NSA award. He didn't answer, even nothing. To the point that the colonel said, look, you are a foreigner. You invaded my country. The least you can have the courtesy to answer me. He didn't say a word. So he came out, and then I asked him if I could get all the documentation from uh, Colonel Selly to photograph for my government. So he gave me his bag, who had a German diary, a big book, uh, but of course written in Spanish, but it was bought in Germany, mm -hmm. where he wrote his uh, diary. He has some photographs of the family, some medicament for his asthma. He has some a small, very small code book, numerical code book that he used to communicate, uh, to be able to transmit and receive from Cuba. Of course, he could not transmit, but he could receive from Radova, Havana, Cuba. Uh, it was given to him by the Chinese. Mm -hmm. uh, he has some a little booklet with typewritten message that he had received from Cuba, signed by Ariel, that we thought was Fidel. And later on, uh, Benigno, who was one who defected and lived in Paris, and we became friends, told me that it wasn't Fidel, it was Juan Carretero, the head of communication for Shed during that operation. So I got all of that, and I started photographing all of those documentation. Then I left it with a soldier. I came back to talk to him. So I stood in front of him and said, Che Guevara, vengo a hablar contigo. I come to talk to you. And he looked to me from the floor, very arrogant, and said, nobody talks to me. Nobody interrogates me. So when I saw that attitude, I looked at him and said, Commander, I didn't come here to uh, interrogate you. Uh, I admire you. You used to be head of a state. You are like this because you believe in your ideals, in, even though I know they are mistaken. I came here to talk to you. So he looked to me for a while to see if I was laughing, if I was serious, and he said, can I see it? Can you untie me? So I asked a soldier to untie him. So we untied him, we sat in a little bench across from where I was, and we started talking. Now, whenever I asked him a question that was of tactical interest to us, he would say, you know, I cannot answer that. But I did push him in, in for example, in his stay in Africa. He didn't want to talk about it. I said, well, you don't want to talk about it, but your own people said you had like 10,000 guerrillas, and they were very poor soldiers. Mm. It was in the Congo. And he looked at me and said, well, if I had 10,000, it really would have been different. But you're right. They were very poor soldiers. Mm -hmm. Then we talk about the Cuban economy. And he started blaming the embargo for the Cuban economy. Okay, now hang on. Because he was trained as a doctor, right? Yeah, he never graduated, but he was trained as a doctor. Okay, so trained as a doctor. Uh, and then he becomes a revolutionary where he kill, he's killing people. And then once the revolution is over in Cuba, didn't Fidel come to a group of people and said, hey... Who knows anything about finance? And he raised his hand. No, no. It wasn't no? like that. It wasn't like that. No. How, how did it happen? He told me. When, when he told me at that point in time that was uh, the Cuban economy was like that because of the embargo, right. I looked at him and said, Commander, that's ironic in your part to say that because you were the minister of, 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 of economy and you were also the president of the National Bank and you are not even an economist. Mm -hmm. So he looked at me and said, you know how I became president of the National Bank? I said, I have no idea. He said, I was standing one, one time, I understood Fidel was asking for a dedicated communist. I rose my hand, and he was the, asking for a dedicated economist. <laughs> so I honestly, <laughs> I honestly believe he was trying to pull my leg. He didn't want to answer the question. <laughs> but later on, when I met Benigno in Paris, that uh, we had an interview in Paris, he told me it was true. He was right next to Camilo Cienfuegos himself, and she understood he was asking for a dedicated communist and rose his hand. <laughs> and that's how he became the head of the National Bank. Didn't feel free. They didn't 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 want to correct himself. Oh, unbelievable! That. Yeah. Um, all right. So you're in. You're talking to him. You're having conversations with this guy that took your country, killed. I'm sure some of your friends, um, destroyed uh, so much. You know that the people who have him want him dead. Uh, how are you feeling at the time, looking across the table at Jay? What does that feel like? Well, first of all, I had mixed feeling. Uh, when I arrived there, I say, well, he should die the same way that he killed so many people. But then when I saw him, he looks like a burger and all of that, I felt sorry for him. 
At the same time, we were told in Washington they wanted to share life no matter what. And I believe now the reason was because they knew of the problems that he got with the Soviet Union. So that's probably why the agency wanted him alive. I even thought for... For what reason, do you suppose? Because he was, uh, he was pro-Chinese. He didn't get along with the Soviet at all. And Cuba depended and on the maybe Soviet Union. he would have information? Or? Maybe they... F- I don't think he would have done it. But the ANC felt that maybe he would talk to him about yeah, that because of was, that feeling, that situation. Wasn't he the guy who said we should use a nuke on oh, yes. New York City? And he said that it would be worthwhile millions of people to die if it was going to implement socialism in the United States. He said that at the United Nations. Wow. And somebody here thought that, oh, maybe this guy will turn they, on. They forgot all of that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Um, I so, even thought at the time, Glenn, that uh, because they wanted him desperately alive, that I could cut the landline. We had a telephone line at that time in Igueras. I could cut the landline when the helicopter arrived. I would tell the, the pilot uh, that my government was able to convince President Barriento to give him alive. And they, I know he had no communication with the uh, with Valle Grande. And once we brought his body alive, then nobody could do that. At the same time, I thought what happened in Cuba when Batista released Fidel Castro and what happened to my country. So I talked to myself and said, look, uh, if you do that and he survived and later on he goes to other places, a lot of people killed, you will feel responsible for it. Let yeah. history run. His, his, this is the dec- decision from the Bolivian government and not yours. Because they have him. They yeah. caught him. Um, but they not only wanted to kill him, right? They wanted to behead him. No, let me let me go by by a all step. Right. First okay. of all, when we were there, uh, Colonel Centeno was in the in the operational field. While he was there, we received a phone call in Igueras, and they asked for the highest ranking officer. I had the rank of captain. There were only two lieutenants. And that's why I received the order from the Barrientos regime to kill him. There was five hundred, six hundred, five hundred was shit. 600 dead, 700 keep him alive. So we received a specific instruction to eliminate him. When Centeno came back, before he left in the helicopter, I called him outside and said, Mi Coronel, this order from your government to eliminate the prisoner. Now the order from my government is tried to keep him alive at all costs. And we have helicopters to be able to move him out from here and up to Panama for interrogation. So he looked at me and said, Felix, my name was Felix Ramos. Say, Felix, we have worked empirically. We're very grateful to you, but this is order from my president and my commander in chief. If I don't comply, I'll be fired. He looked at his watch and he said, the helicopter is going, after I leave, the helicopter is going to come several times, bringing food of ammunition and taking our dead and our wounded. After two o'clock in the afternoon, he's going to come back to pick up the Che Guevara's dead body. You can execute him. Actually, he said, you can ask, I used to see him any way you want, because we know how much harm he has done to your country. But I want your word of honor that you would bring me back the dead body of Che after two o'clock. Wow. I say, my coronel tried to make them change their mind, but if there's no change, I will guarantee I'll bring you back the dead body of Shea. We embraced and he left. And sure enough, the helicopter came several times. At one point, the pilot came to where I was with a camera from Major Saucedo and told me, the Capitan, Major Saucedo wanted a, a picture with the prisoner. So I look at Shea and say, Commander, do you mind? I say, no. That's when we took him around in the schoolhouse, and that's when I gave my camera to him, and that's the picture that I gave you. And then I took his camera, I just put 2,000 speed and closed the lens. The picture never came out. Because I thought if these people will release him, uh, release the picture, and he's there telling everybody that he died from combat wounds, it's going to be embarrassment to the Bolivian government. So that picture never came out. Uh-huh. So the helicopter left. And we started waiting uh, to see what happened. Around 12.30 in the afternoon, this lady came with a little radio on her hand. Mi capitán, mi capitán, when are you going to kill him? Say, lady, why do you say that? He said, look, we just saw you photograph with him right in front of the schoolhouse here. And look, the radio is already giving the news that he died from combat wounds. So at that point, I thought there was nothing else to wait for. So I walked into the room. I stood in front of him. He was uh, sitting on a little bench that we had put him. And I looked at him and said, Commander, I'm sorry. I tried my best. He's ordered from the high Bolivian command. Did he know what you he were talking He knew exactly about? what I was saying. He turned white like a piece of paper. I had never seen somebody to lose the expression like he did. But then he composed himself and said, it's better this way. I should have never been captured alive. And he pulled the pipe that he had on his side out and said, I'd like to give this pipe to a soldadito who treated me well. And at that point in time, Sergeant Mario Terán, who was the one executing people, burst into the room. Yo quiero la pipa, mi capitán, I want the pipe. And Che dijo, no, ti no te la doy. No. So I have to order him twice to leave the room, which he did. And Che had the pipe here. So I look at, say, at him and say, Commander, will you give it to me? He thought for a few seconds, he said, he gave me the pipe, I put it here. What did he here. say? Yes, what? 
Hmm? He, he said yes. Yeah, would you, and he said yes. He gave it to me. Okay. So he put the pipe here and said, if, if I can, do you want anything for your family? Then actually, what I will say in a sarcastic way, he said, if you can't tell Fidel that he will soon see a triumphant revolution in America. Which is, to me, it's like telling him, you know, you abandoned me, but this is going to be successful no matter what. <clears throat> and then he changed the expression saying, if you can't tell my wife to remarry and try to be happy. That was his last word. He approached me, we shook hands, we embraced, and he stood in attention thinking I was going to be the one to shoot him. And let me tell you, that was a very emotional situation for me because as a soldier, as a military guy, uh, we don't order the execution of a prisoner. But this was a very unique situation, which is pretty hard to take, to go out. And when I came out, I told the sergeant, it's ordered from your co high command to eliminate the prisoner. Don't shoot from here up. Shoot from here down because he's supposed to die come from combat wounds. See me, Capitan. See me, Capitan. It was exactly one o'clock in the afternoon, Bolivian time, when I left. I went to the area where I was taking the photograph of the diary. At about 1.15 exactly, I heard the burst. And that's when he was killed. And did they not take his hands or? That came later on. <laughs> on this. Okay. What? what? Well, after, after, the... after that, after a couple of hours or so, then. Captain... What did they do with the body? Did you go back? Yeah, well. A couple of hours later, Gary Prado and Celso Torelli, the Duke captain, came, and we all went to see the, the dead body for the first time. He was on the floor uh, facing the, um, the, the ceiling. His face was covered with mud. It was probably because he hit the ground, and the ground was muddy. You know, you had a, 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 a lot of mud in there. And then we went around the body, and Celso Torelli had a little stick and said, you son of a bitch, you have killed so many of my soldiers. And then Gary Prado said, Mi Capitan, we have finished the guerrillas in Latin America. And I told him, Mi Capitan, if we haven't finished them, at least we have delayed them for, for a long time. So and the, and le at least what? We have delayed them for a long time, Okay, okay. guerrillas. Yes. So they left. So I asked uh, for a bucket of water. Uh, so they bought a little bucket of water. I went down. I, I cleaned his face. I took all the mud out from his face. I tried to close his jaw with my handkerchief, which later on blew with the helicopter uh, air. And I tried to close his eye, which I could not. It would pop up again. Why, why did you feel it was necessary to do that? I don't know. It's, it's, it's something like... Common decency? Yeah. Good for I you. I felt, you know, I have to do that. Good for you. And, uh, and then we, we, they brought the uh, stretcher. We, we put the body in the stretcher. We put it to the right side of the helicopter. I remember we were tying it. And then the mayor, Nino Guzman, told me, Mi Capitan, moving forward, you know, to balance the helicopter. So I put my hand under his body and I pulled up. When I got the hand, I was completely covered with blood. Apparently, they hit the aorta, and because it was a plastic uh, stretcher, uh, the blood concentrated there. I remember, I didn't say a word, but I remember thinking, say, there are people who have blood in their hand. I have the hell of a lot of. And I uh. cleaned the hand on the right side of my pant, finished tying him down, jumped into the helicopter a little bit to the left side to balance, and then a soldier came and said, Mi mayor, mi mayor, Father Chillers want to see it. It was a, a Catholic priest. So we waited like two, three minutes with the engine running. Here come this priest on top of a mule, so all around, close on the right side. He went, I almost got decapitated by the helicopter. It was this close from the blade. Yeah. He came down from the mule. He looked at him and gave him the last bit, which I took a couple of pictures with a Minox camera that I had left when he was giving the... Uh, the right. uh, to, to, and I thought to myself, this guy was an atheist. Nevertheless, he received the last ritual from the Catholic Church. Uh. And from there, we took off. We landed in, in Valle Grande. There was... When I left, there was nobody there. There was 2,000 people on the wrong way. There were wow. like 15 additional planes. Four additional C-54 military planes with all, you know, the generals and admiral, everybody was there, and the press. There was like 15 small planes from different CBS, NBC, whatever, uh, in the area. So my friend who had arrived took the body, and they took it to the hospital at Metro Senor de Malta. And I stayed with the, with the pilot and the head of intelligence. That evening, we had a meeting uh, in the headquarters in that area, when I arrived, uh, a general was telling this colonel, if Fidel denied this is Che Guevara, we need tangible proof of it. Cut his head and put him for Malahide. Oh, my God. Say, my general, you cannot do that. I said, why not? Said, Supposedly, Fidel denied this is Che Guevara. You are a head of a state. You cannot show the head of a human being as proof. I said, well, what do you suggest? Say, my general, you want some tangible proof of it, cut one finger. We have the fingerprint from the Argentinian Federal Police, and they can be checked. So he ordered both hands to be cut. Both hands to be cut. So I left there because I had to take all of the documentation back to La, to, by, uh, to Santa Cruz and from there to La Paz. And my friend stayed and he claimed that in about three or four o'clock in the morning when there was no press around, the doctor came and they cut both hands and put him from Alahai. 
And then a pickup that they called Volqueta, they drove the body of Shea and two more. There were three bodies all together to the very end of the runway. And that's where they had a bulldozer who was expanding the runway for bigger planes to land. They dug a huge hole in the very middle of the runway and they dropped Che and two bodies there. And they covered wow. it. Up. Now, when Fidel claimed that he found Che Guevara's body on the side of the runway, there were seven other bodies next to him. I don't know who the hell he got out of there, but he wasn't Che, believe me. Huh. So he kind of was buried like Jimmy Hoffa. But his hand turned out in Cuba because the, the Minister of Interior, Arguedas, took the hand to Fidel. So at least if they put that in his, in his burial place, he will have a part of Shane there because the hands were turned over to Cuba. But the body, that was not Che Guevara's body. Wow. Okay. So that's 67, 68? 67. 67. October 9, 1967. Right. And then, uh, and then you volunteered to go to Vietnam. No, no, after that, they sent me, first of all, uh, for a short time to Ecuador, which I trained the intelligence equal to our, their secret service. So we right. trained them. And then I was sent to Peru to, to an anti guerrilla unit in Peru where my little training uh, for the, uh, for the uh, October crash took place. Because I arrived in, in, in Peru, in Mazamari, the same area where the, the CIA was training this uh, special uh, police unit, a separate trooper unit. The special force already has trained them. So when I arrived the first weekend, the commander of the, of the police unit, uh, Danilo Agramonte, said, Mr. Advisor, are you a paratrooper? And out of embarrassment, he said, yes, sir, I am your advisor. He said, how many jump? I said, 100. I never jumped from a plane in my life. <laughs> so I went to see a friend of mine, Javier de Vincenzo, who was a captain. I said, look, how you put this thing on? He looked at me and said, you have never jump? I said, no. I said, you're nuts. You're going to get killed. I said, bullshit. You know, I, I got the training already. So let's go to my room and let's jump from a table, my three point of contact. Right. And that's what I did. And then I jumped with them like 13 times. Wow. And I got my win from the Peruvian uh, um, police. But then I was supposed to be there two years. Then the military coup of Velasco Alvarado took place in late 1968. And, uh, and with that, uh, the, we were surrounded by the, by the army because uh, the police unit was not in agreement with with the coup. As a matter of fact, the commander wanted to ask a plane for training, and he was going to jump the police into the presidential palace to regain the presidency to be President Belaunde III, who was the constitutional president uh, of, of Peru. And he asked me, he said, Mr. Abbas, will you jump with us? I look at him and say, this is a training exercise, right? The guy said, right. I say, of course I go with you. But of course, then the, the army never sent the airplane for us to train. And then when we rotated for for Christmas, uh, because Velasco Barat turned to the Soviet Union, all the military assistance was terminated. And that's why I volunteered for Vietnam. I went there in 19, early 1970. Um, then in 76, you decided, were you still with the CIA when you were in Vietnam? Yeah, uh, yes. I was with the advisor to the PRU, Provincial Reconnaissance Unit in Vietnam. Which meant what? What did you do? It was a special uh, paramilitary unit that we had in every single province all over Vietnam. Uh, I was assigned to Region 3. Region 3 is the 11 provinces around Saigon, the most important region. And we had every one of those units were former Viet Cong and Chu Hoi, people who had turned over from the Viet Cong area. And they were very effective against the Viet Cong because they knew them. They knew yeah, the yeah, tactics yeah. and everything. Yeah. So we advised them, we provided them with intelligence, and we run operation with... Uh, asset from the U.S. Armed Forces uh, against the, the infrastructure of the Viet Cong in the area. During that time, it was shut down five times. Uh, uh, but, you know, I came out fine. Well, eventually, I had to be evacuated because of back problem because of this uh, helicopter accident. You were shot five times, did no. I hear you say? Yeah. During, well, it was during the, over two years. I spent a whole tour a year and a half, and I extended for another year and a half. But then, because of my back problem, they, they evacuated me back to the United States in in April of 1972. Uh, 70, and 75 or 76 you leave the CIA? Right, 76 I left the CIA. And that's because uh, there was a death threat? Uh, yes. They, if, first of all, for example, while I was still there uh, in, in Vietnam in, from 1970 to 71, I was called by the U.S. station, told me not to fly directly to Miami because they had a, a Cuban intelligence defector in Paris who claimed they were going to hijack the plane of the Cuban involved in the assassination of Che Guevara. Wow. So I flew to Atlanta. Even though, che, even though Cuba wanted him dead. Yes, but to them it's a symbol. Right. To be able to get somebody who claimed that right. their hero uh, right. was right. killed. 
So I did fly to Atlanta, took a car, went back to Atlanta, and they have a cousin in Atlanta. So I stayed. There was a flight going back to Vietnam who left, uh, actually, Dallas, Dallas, uh, San Francisco. And there was another one who was Houston, Houston, San Francisco, an hour later. Mm -hmm. So I took the one an hour later to stay with my cousin one more hour. When I arrived to Saigon, nobody was waiting for me. So I went to the Duke Hotel, changed, I got to the U.S. Embassy, and they look at me and say, what are you doing here? I said, I'm supposed to arrive today and nobody was waiting for me. I say, no, 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 your plane was hijacked to Cuba. The one we had in the program that you were going to fly from there to San Francisco. <sighs> so even, even after when I was evacuated, later on they sent me to Argentina, what the agency did, they gave me a passport for me and my wife that said that we were born in Colorado. That's the only time I was a born United States citizen for uh, less than a year. Because in case our plane got hijacked, they could reclaim me as a U.S. citizen by birth. Uh, um, and we, you, they offered to change your name and yes. change your life, and you were like, nah. Yeah, in 75, they assassinated Centeno, Anaya, the, the one who was his advisor in Paris. And they put the so-called Commando Che Guevara. They assassinated a, a colonel... Roberto Quintanilla in Hamburg, Germany, who was the Consul General for Bolivia, and leave the same message, uh, Che Guevara's commando. And then they called my home, and using my earliest name, Felix Ramos, you are next. That's what they told me. So uh -huh. I told the agency. So they came back and said, look, we are going to change your name. We're going to send you to another state. But, it, you know, with two kids at the age that they were, it, it was a trauma for them to be able to move them from their school, their friends, to another unknown place with a different name. So I told the agency I could not do that. So we got to an agreement uh, what they did was they built a garage in my home next to my car, which stay inside the garage at night. Uh, I got a license to carry a concealed weapon, who was very difficult at the time to get. Uh, they in, um, put the iron fences in my house all around uh, the area. Uh, you know, they gave me a, a telephone in the car. That was, at the time, that was oh, yeah. 10 years of waiting period. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I, I actually, when I applied for the phone, they told me, called me in 10 years. I told the agency. And when I called back, the guy said, Mr. Rodriguez, I don't know who the hell you are, but your phone number is on, so we'll be connected the day after tomorrow. <laughs> I got in 48 hours my phone. Wow. And I signed a relief. If I got killed connected to service, my family will not uh, claim anything because I refuse what they really consider uh, a, 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 a security a package for me. But they did give you one other thing at the time. They gave you... Uh uh, silver, silver star. Yeah, when for, came from that, they gave me the Intelligence Star for Valor, which is for what they call extraordinary service of heroism from Vietnam. That's and amazing. I received like nine cross of gallantry from the Vietnamese uh, uh, Army and also a Naval Medal of Honor uh, from the Vietnamese Navy because I stopped the rocketing of the boat of Saigon. And I stopped the rocketing of the city of Saigon too. That was very, very difficult. Nobody had been able to do that before. How did you do that? Well, the one on the boat was, you know, they were having a, a unit sh shooting at the boat whenever they came in. And all those boats coming in were escorted by the Navy Seawolf gunship. Whenever they saw the explosion, they never got anything. I was able to capture one of these paramilitary units of the Viet Cong that they called sappers. And when they had, they had, they put the rocket in a, in a wooden platform, and then they run an electrical cable about 50 meters. And they had a point of reference. So whenever they had the point of reference, they, from a 50 meter distance, they activated the rocket who hit the boat. Now... The gunship was hitting the explosion. Nobody was there. So I got on the following day, all the guy from the Navy gunship, I put a, a red smoke grenade in the middle, a yellow 50 meter on both sides so they can see, take a look at the distance. And from there on, every time they saw an explosion, they would hit on both sides. We never know what they were operating. And they were able to kill like six teams, and they had no idea what was going on. Wow. We started rocketing of, of, of the boat. Wow. So got the Medal of Honor from the Vietnamese Navy. And then the rocketing of the city of Saigon, we couldn't find the people in the, in the unit we were looking for until we captured one guy who told us where they were, they, where they were actually had the base camp. We never looked in that area because it's a very high tide, water of tide. It will go like 15 feet, and nobody could live there. So we, we never looked for them in that area. So this guy told us they had 55 colon drums soldered one on top of the other. So at night when the water started racing, he would go on top of that drum and live there. When he went down, he walked through the rocket, 122 rocket, into the, into the area of Saigon City, and then went back into that hole. So we started looking to that area. And then it was very easy, because they were walking, and it was fresh mud, so we could see the step. And we were <laughs> able to eliminate most of them. And in the 4th of December of, of 1970, uh, uh, we were able to kill Tutan, the head of the unit uh, that was doing the rocketing of Saigon. And then after that, they were not able to hit one single rock into the city until after I left. So from... From 1960, uh, 61 to 76, 
Did you ever see or feel at any time that the United States was being dishonorable? No. As a matter of fact, when you talk about the Bay of Pigs, uh, there are some Cubans, especially from the Brigade, who claim uh, President Kennedy was a traitor. I don't believe he was a traitor. I believe he was a young president because you are a traitor because you do something purposely. Yeah. I don't think he purposely wanted the Bay of Pigs to be a yeah, failure yeah. because it was a failure to his administration. I think it was a young president with no experience and very, very badly advised. And because of my experience with our team, after we went to, because when the president received us at the Orange Bowl in late 1962, after he pulled the brigade out, he promised us to give us, uh, to return our flag very soon in a free Havana. Actually, I was able to shook the president's hand because he came to say hello to the survivor of the infiltration team. So I remember shook the president's hand, told him wow. we shall return. And of course, you know, that was a symbolic thing. Yeah. And then he opened the armed forces of the United States for the brigade. So I was one of the 212 officers from the brigade who went to Fort Benning, in Georgia as a second lieutenant commissioned by the president. When we finished that, our team asked me to go with him uh, to a special operation in Central America sponsored by the president. Okay. And, uh, and I asked him at the time, I said, look, Manolo, you know, what guarantee do I have that the president is behind this operation? He asked me, he said, what guarantee do you need? I said, well, you want me to leave the army and go into this motel to get a training from the CIA on communications? Give it to me in uniform, being paid by the U.S. government. You do that, I'll resign, I'll go with you. So he told me, fine, go and see your supervisor and tell him you want a special communication training. So I go and see this Major Angel Torres, who was a Puerto Rican in charge of training, and say, Major Torres, Lieutenant Rodriguez, I'd like to change to a special communication training. I was supposed to go for intelligence training. So he looked at me and said, look, Lieutenant, uh, first of all, there is no such thing as a special communication training. Second, if it were, there is no time to change. You are going to Fort Hollow in Virginia for intelligence training. And third, who told you? Say, sir, I cannot tell you. He threw me out of his office, which is normal. <laughs> so I go to Miami on vacation, and about a week later, I got a call from Aurora Street, the recruiting center. Call immediately Major Torres. So I call Major Torres, say, Lieutenant Rodriguez, come to Fort Benning immediately. We have here Mr. Moose and Mr. Flanagan to give you your special communication training. Uh. So I went back to Fort Benning. They got us a room inside the base with two other guys that was with me. They gave us the training, and then we resigned to the commission and we went with him to Central America. But then the president was assassinated. And later on, Johnson told the member of the brigade that the promise of the president to liberate Cuba died with the president. Those who wanted to stay in the armed forces, yeah. they were welcome. But there was no longer a commitment uh, yeah. to do that. But Bobby Kennedy was very, very much committed on that. Bobby so, Kennedy was different than his brother. He, he seemed like a decent guy. When we were working the operation in Central America with our team in Costa Rica and Nicaragua, running raids against Cuba in 64-65, Bobby Kennedy was what liaison between us and the CIA for that operation. Yeah. And when the president was assassinated, our team went to see him in Washington. And the first two words that he told him said, my brother had two big enemies, the mafia and Fidel Castro. And I believe it was the last one who assassinated him. And what do you think? I think so. I think that the, the president... So had you the, don't think that it was Lee Harvey Oswald? Or? It was Lee Harvey Oswald with another shooter who probably was uh, a Cuban uh, captain. Uh, who was uh, an expert in shooting, also spoke fluent uh, English, Fabian Escalante, who was in Dallas that day. And then it's documented that he left in a private plane for Mexico after the assassination. Of course, even I saw one time in the paper, one assistant of, of, of President Johnson claiming that I did have information from the Bureau of the Cuban Participation on the assassination of the president. And they had to cover it up for national security reasons. If they had to admit that a country like Cuba had participated in the assassination of an American president, they had no choice but to invade. And they still had some offensive missiles inside Cuba. They didn't want to face that. So they covered that for national security. So I believe that Fabian Escalante was the second shooter. Wow. Uh, I, gotta, I mean, you are at event after event after event. You leave 76. Then in 85, you come back and you are part of something that becomes a gigantic deal, the, uh, the Contra scandal. You were down in El Salvador. Right. Well, actually, when I started that, it had nothing to do with the Contra. I had a helicopter concept that I developed in Vietnam against the, the, uh, the guerrillas, who was very effective in Vietnam. And I thought I could do that with the guerrillas in El Salvador. So I turned to my friend Don Gregg, who was my boss in Vietnam, who turned out to be then the National Security Advisor to Vice President Bush. And he knew how effective this concept had been in Vietnam. So he helped me 
uh, with the administration to get contact. For example, he sent me to talk to Thomas Molly, the Secretary of State for Latin America, Nestor Sanchez, Secretary of Defense for Latin America, to brief them uh, on a concept that I wanted to develop in El Salvador. And, and then I met the head of the Salvadorian Air Force. And I offer my service to, you know, to go there and, and try to implement this concept. Of course, the general told me, and say, fine, he saw my credential, everything. There's a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, uh, I cannot pay you. I said, who's asking for pay? I have my retirement from the agency. The only thing that I need is a plate where I can operate from to implement my concept. So he accepted. Now, then there was a problem with General Gorman, three, four-star general of Southcom, who was in charge of all this military assistance in Latin America. And here is this guy retired from the CIA who wants to implement a military concept in his area. Of course, he's of concern. So erroneously, he had been told I was very close to Bush. I was not. I was close to Don Gregg. So he asked Admiral, Admiral uh, who was in charge of, 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 of uh, advisor to Vice President uh, Bush, that he wanted to talk to me. So I went to Panama, I briefed General Gorman, and then he sent me to El Salvador to brief uh, Ambassador Pickering. And then we all agreed for me to go down there. So I moved into El, Salva, El Salvador to start preparing my helicopter concept. And in the first day of my operation, which I actually programmed for the 17th of April, this date of the Bay of Pigs. But then when the Salvadorians saw the intelligence that was good, they put me back to the 18th of April. And on that day, they sent some troops in the ground to the area that I had selected. So when we arrived, there was nobody there. But in the afternoon, we went to another area. And we were lucky that we were able to capture Nidia Diaz, the commander of the PRTC. She was the highest guerrilla commander ever been captured by the Salvadorian. And she was the one who was responsible for the assassination of the uh, Marines at the Zona Rosas in El Salvador. The PRTC was her unit, Partido Revolucionario de los Trabajadores Centroamericanos. So we captured her, and she was then exchanged for President Duarte's daughter, who was uh, kidnapped. And she went to live in Cuba. Then she went back to El Salvador. Now she's a congresswoman in El Salvador to, the, to this day. From there on, the, the operation was very, very effective. Uh, on, you met you met Ali North at this time, right? Yeah, I have met him one time, uh, sent by a guy from the State Department to meet him uh, in Washington. But I had nothing to do with him at all. But then what happened was, uh, Glenn, at the end of 1986, at the end of 1985, uh, he had a problem with some weapon that he had bought in Portugal for the Honduras. And Honduras had stopped all the operation in there because Calero's brother, who was the head of the country at the time, brought a plane from New Orleans with a uniform and things like that, and he got a crew of television on the plane. And they landed in Palmerola military airfield. So when the Hondurans saw that, they were mad because, you know, everybody knew they were helping, but not that often to have a plane land at their military base and have the crew film everything. So they sent the plane back with everything, including the crew, and they stopped the operation. And North had a plane, a southern airplane a, a, in, in uh, Portugal loaded with, with weapons. He could not bring it. It was costing a lot of money. So he knew I had been very successful in the Salvador with the Operation Agua. So he asked me if I could ask the Salvadorian to storage the, all of these military weapons coming from Portugal. So I went to see the head of the Air Force. He sent me to talk to the Minister of Defense. I convinced them, and they allowed to do that. That's how I got involved later on with the Iran-Contra thing. They used the, brought the plane to our area, they storage there. Then they asked me if they could do the maintenance of the aircraft in El Salvador, and they would provide everything. So, you know, they agree, and that's how I got involved in the Iran Contra thing. But Senator Kennedy, or Kerry. Oh, don't talk to me about it. I hate that son of a bitch. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Well, tell me what you really feel. Okay. Uh, because of that, I had to testify in Congress. Uh, they called me as, as a witness uh, to testify in Congress. I testified on the 27th, 28th of May, 1987, in open hearing in Congress. During that time, there was one, actually, Republican senator who asked me if I had any information about the Sandinistas involved in narco-trafficking. In early 1985, a police officer, a friend of mine who was in Dade County Police, who had a private company, then asked me to meet this guy, who was a money launderer for the Medellin cartel, who claimed that he could compromise the Nicaraguan resistance in narco-trafficking. But he said he wanted to deal with the DEA or with the FBI because they were penetrating. He wanted to deal with somebody from the CIA or from the vice president office who had to do with uh, our narco-trafficking. So I met this guy whose name was Ramon Milian Rodriguez. He claimed he had a tape from uh, an assistant of Daniel Ortega who called him from Guatemala, asking him to jump bail to set up a money laundering operation for them out of Panama. So I mentioned that during the hearing. Kerry, who heard that, sent his assistant, Jack Blum, to find out where this guy was. 
Now, Ramon Millán Rodriguez this time was in a federal prison with 45 years because of his uh, narco trafficking thing. Because he was picked up in Miami with $10 million of the drug cartel to fly right. to Panama. So they went to see him. And what I understand, they told the guy, if you can compromise the vice president through Felix, it has to be true. You cannot lie to us. But if you can compromise the vice president through Felix, we are going to lower your sentence. So the guy comes back and says, oh, yeah, Felix was a patriot. He didn't touch a penny of this thing. But he got from us $10 million from the cartel for the contrast. And in exchange, uh, the vice president was going to be lenient with the Medellin cartel, which is ridiculous. So after I testify in Congress, I am back in El Salvador, and I am flying with the Salvadorian Air Force, and my wife called me pretty upset. It was my picture in front page of the Miami Herald when I was in the Army as a second lieutenant. I claimed I received $10 million from the Medellin cartel. I said, Ross, you know, that's BS. I said, no, 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 you also have a subpoena from Senator Kerry's committee. So I asked her to send this subpoena to El Salvador. I got the, the subpoena. I called his office. I didn't talk to him, of course, I talked to an assistant and said, look, you don't need a subpoena with me, but send the ticket in Easter because I am doing mileage. I'll go there and uh, I'll talk to you. So they sent the ticket in Easter. I flew to Washington. He was the, the majority of this, of this committee in narco trafficking and special operation. And the minority was Mitch McConnell. So there was an assistant on Mitch McConnell, a Jack Blum on behalf of uh, Senator Curry. They deposed me for over four hours. At the end of our testimony, we wanted an open hearing. There's nothing to hide. They wanted to close here. Right. He said, why? I retired in, back in 1976. We're talking something that happened in 1985. What is this secrecy? No, he didn't want the truth to come out. So they insisted on a close hearing. So it had to be a close hearing. So we went to a close hearing. And I recall there were all the senators, and they asked me if I wanted to say something. So I look at Kerry in his face and say, Senator, this will be the hardest testimony of my life. I already had testified in Congress today, without lawyer, without immunity. And I said, why do you say that, Mr. Rodriguez? I say, Senator... It's very difficult to have to answer questions for somebody that you do not respect. I don't respect you and what you are doing here. Boy, he blew his top. Oh, I bet he did. Not because we disagree with you, we are less patriotic than you are. I say, Senator, you didn't even have the courage to throw your own medals when you were protesting the Vietnam War. Mr. Rodriguez, don't believe you see everything in the press. I say, Senator, I know that the hell of a lot of better than you do. Then he told me, that was a veteran who asked me to throw his medal. I said, everybody's perception was, was your medal were throwing over the, the White House fence. So we went back and forth. It didn't go very nicely. We finished the hearing, closed hearing. For 10 months, my uncle asked for an open hearing. He would not give it to us. Until Senator Mitch McConnell called me and I asked me if I would go to Washington and ask on a press conference an open hearing. So I did. I went to Washington. We had a, a hearing, not a hearing. We had a, a press conference at the Senate. And there I had a, a statement where I explained every every detail of my connection with uh, Ramon Millán Rodríguez, everything that transpired. And at the end, I wrote, I hope this is for honest purposes and not for the political reason of Senator Kerry. Uh -huh. So on the following day, he gave us an open hearing. On Friday, that's the only day of the week they don't have any cameras yeah. in the Senate. Yeah, it's news. There was no care. camera. Yeah. I was the last witness. With me, by the time I went to testify, 90% of the press was already gone. And there he apologized to me. Oh, then he asked me, will you take a lie detector test? I said, of course, but I want you to give you one too because this is political. I said, well, I won't take one. I said, well, you don't take one, I won't take one either. But if you take a lie detector test, I'll take it. So he didn't, so I didn't. So that was the end of that. Then he asked for, which is great, he asked for one of the best uh, polygraph operators in the country, Dr. Rafkin from the University of Utah. They gave Ramon Millán Rodriguez a lie detector test. First question, did Mr. Rodriguez solicited for you $10 million from the drug cartel? Yes, deceptive, he was lying. Second question, the Mr. Rodriguez gave you couriers in Central America to channelize this $10 million. Yes, deceptive, he was lying. Third question, did Mr. Rodriguez receive in any way or form any money from the Medellin cartel? Ramon Millán Rodriguez refused to continue with the lie detector test. How is Senator Kerry writing the congressional wow. testimony? First two, he had no choice. Right. On the third, he writes, on the third question, whether Mr. Rodriguez received uh, any money from the Medellin cartel, the operator could not determine the veracity of the question, and he leave it like that. Wow. So you listen to that, you say, well, maybe some truth to it. But they never tell you that he didn't determine anything because the guy right. refused to continue with the lie detector test. That's what I hate this so much. So, <laughs> so let me just ask one, you know, 60 minutes question. So what did you do with the $10 million? <laughs> That's what my wife has asked me. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we still living here, Felix? If you have if ten million, million dollars, dollars, I wouldn't be here now. That's right. That's right. Um, when the Berlin Wall fell, what went through your mind? 
a lot of us thought that Cuba was going to be next, really. And then, uh, because of special circumstances, it didn't. Uh, the Cuban intelligence has maintained a tremendous uh, force in, in control in, in the island. Uh, they went to a special period. And then Venezuela came to supply the money that was cut off by the Soviet Union. So did you foresee this resurgence of socialism like it like like is happening now i mean the venezuelans that was a prosperous country it had its problems but it was a prosperous country and they have just destroyed it just destroyed it and people are starving absolutely let me tell you that was a factor in the election in costa rica a few years ago the leftists candidate who was on, in front of the polls ahead of the traditional candidate in Costa Rica who was a sympathizer of Hugo Chavez what the opposition did they started putting movies of Venezuela here's Venezuela before socialism uh -huh. here's Venezuela with socialism that guy didn't even go to the second round wow he lost completely how do you feel about I don't want to talk about politics per se but uh, none of the or maybe there's one of the uh, Democratic candidates. They won't say that they're free market based. Um, many of them are saying that they're democratic socialists. It's amazing. I don't know how anybody can believe in socialism after what happened in Cuba and what happened, what's happening in Venezuela. Like you say, the, the richest country in Latin America. Cuba in 1958 was one of the most prosperous nations yeah. in the continent. Uh, they were like number two, two or three uh, in the whole hemisphere. Uh, I, I would tell people that come back from Cuba that they would not believe that during that time people would look at the newspaper to find out where the meat was cheaper. No, that was mean that was cheaper. They, they, don't, they cannot understand that's, that to be true because of the lack of everything in those countries. Socialism destroyed the in, insensitive of people to work and destroy the economy. Nobody could have perceived that Venezuela with all the resources, the, the richest oil in the uh, country in Latin America, with the richest largest reserving oil nationwide, worldwide, could be the way it is today. When they destroy the private sector, they destroy the capacity of people to, to, to really progress. And it's amazing. Are you um, optimistic for America or pessimistic? I'm optimistic in a way. Uh, I, I worry a little bit about what's going on, um, you know, in, in like Bernie Sanders and all of that. And I cannot believe these young people that support him uh, he's declared socialist, and look what socialism has done. Uh, they should understand from history what's happened to the socialist country. It has never worked. Uh, it destroyed the economy. It destroyed the, the, what they do equal, equal is bring poverty to everybody. Yeah. It's what they do. That's the only equality that they bring. And, and it's amazing that there were people that will support guys like him. But I understand also there's a lot of American universities who have very lefty professor. And they have been watching the, those people for years and years and years. And that's why they really believe that socialism can work. When in reality, we all know it doesn't work. They'll point to, Swiss, or to Sweden and say that's a, that's a socialized uh, country. Hmm? They, they'll point to Sweden or, you know, the Netherlands and say, well, this is a, this is a socialist. Yeah, but we are not Sweden. We are American. That's the difference. What's the difference? Uh, the mentality, the people that we were formed here from, from different countries, uh, the way we operate, and the freedom that we have in here, uh, the opportunity that we have uh, people to progress in this country, uh, you don't see anywhere else in the world. It all depends on you. What I tell people is people should have the, the opportunity uh, to progress. They should have the opportunity for uh, a school and all of that thing so they can, but they can depend on you. You cannot expect everybody, like put example of two brothers, one that worked like hell from yeah. 8 o'clock in the morning to 8 yeah. o'clock at night, the other one who doesn't do anything. You cannot expect both of them to have the same thing at the end right. of, of, of the month. Right. Because one have earned it, the other one have not. Opportunity you should have, but then it depends on you as an individual. You've lived in exile your whole life, almost your whole life. Yeah. Do you feel like you're uh, an exile or do you feel now just all-American? For many years, I always wanted, and I, we all respect this country very much. It gave us what we didn't have down there. 
We love America. But for many years, I thought, you know, I wanted to go back to Cuba to live in there. Eventually, when that changed. After so many years, uh, my son and my daughter were born here. Uh, we have a granddaughter going to university. Uh, we have a grandson. And now all my, you know, I will, I will just visit there. And I consider yeah. America more my home than really yeah. doing reality. Tell me what you think is going to happen to Cuba. It's hard to say it right now. With the pass away of Fidel and now the probability of passing away of Raul, uh, they will have to face a, a reality. I don't think they will be able to maintain what they have today. Uh, it could evolve. I mean, nobody knows whether it's going to be a long time or a short time. Yeah. But it could change drastically, drastically. Especially now, if it looks like, uh, in a way, uh, Venezuela goes down uh, from communism into a democracy. And if it does, it will stop the barrel of oil that they're giving Cuba for free. Okay, and they won't be able to maintain that at all. They, they will be forced to go to have changes. And hopefully then uh, we could start working on a democracy as we know it. Mm. Felix, thank you. It has been a real pleasure of being with you it here. It is. Man. It's remarkable, remarkable to uh, meet a man that has been at the center of so much of American history. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.